Are we recording? Yes. Okay, good. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining our webinar today um, on ensuring livestock under whole farm revenue protection uh, for producers. Um, my name is Anna Johnson. I'm going to start things off, and I'm going to do a few introductions. Um, I'm a policy associate at the Center for Rural Affairs. We're a nonprofit organization, and we advocate for healthy rural communities. We're based in Nebraska, but we work nationally. Uh, we believe that healthy small and mid-sized farms are a key component of many healthy rural communities and that access to good risk management strategies is an important part of farm viability. So we're really excited to be hosting a series of webinars on the crop insurance program Whole Farm Revenue Protection, which is designed for diversified operations. Um, today's webinars are the last in our series and um, today we're focusing on livestock operations. So we're going to hear today from two experts on whole farm revenue protection. Um, Scott Marlowe is the Executive Director of Rural Advancement Foundation International, which is a North Carolina-based nonprofit. And then Cliff Parker, who's having a little bit of a technical difficulties, but we're, um, we're, we've, we've heard that he's, he's logging on, so he'll be, he'll be here when it's time for him to talk. Um, Cliff Parker previously served in USDA's Risk Management Agency, which is um, the arm of USDA that administers crop insurance and he served as Deputy Assistant Deputy Administrator for Insurance Services. And Cliff now works as an independent risk management consultant. So, so we have an hour for this webinar, um, and Scott and Cliff are each going to present, and then we'll have about 20 minutes at the end for questions. Um, and we also have another webinar um, for crop insurance agents coming up right after this one, so I think we're going to sign off a couple minutes before the hour to give ourselves time to switch over. Um, so before we kick it off, I have a couple logistical things. Um, first. On your webinar um, 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 program, you should see a question box where you can enter in questions. And feel free to enter questions during the presentation, and we'll also be um, um, you know, answering questions at the end. And, um, and then also today's webinar is being recorded, and we're going to post it to YouTube later, so you can go back and review it. Um, and review our other webinars as well. So um, thank you again, everybody, for coming. And with that, I will hand it over to Scott. All right. Um, thank you very much, Anna. I'm glad to be here. Um, just one second while we figure this out. And there we go. So uh, I am Scott Marlowe with the Rural Advancement Foundation International. Um, similar to, as Anna was saying, about uh, Center for Rural Affairs. We are based in North Carolina, but we work uh, regionally, nationally, and internationally on a wide range of sustainable agriculture and social justice issues, um, and have worked quite a bit on whole farm revenue back from when it was adjusted gross revenue light crop insurance back a few years ago and through the transition and dissemination. Um, and I, I, I appreciate being able to do these webinars. This the, the whole farm revenue is a policy that in our mind is, is very much underutilized and um, that you know we're really hoping can um, fill in a lot of gaps for producers on their risk management strategies. So, so first of all, why is this important? And I, I'm, I'm going to give some background information and a little bit of orientation on crop insurance and other things. And then Cliff is going to dive into the nuts and bolts and some of the nitty gritty about the, uh, about the policy itself. So first of all, um, crop insurance is the primary government program for addressing production losses in agriculture. And that's, um, the uh, Congress has basically been very clear about that, that crop insurance is really where it's at. And so there's fairly low levels of chance that if there are significant production losses from any, for, any, for any natural disaster reasons, you know, there's, there's really, n they're not doing the kind of ad hoc programs that they used to do. Um, but in our experience, crop insurance is important long before the disaster happens because it's very integral to lending and it really changes how um, an operating loan is collateralized and access to credit and the ability to, to grow an operation. And that's one of the reasons why we've worked on it so much over time. Um, the other thing is that we know that we're facing very much changing weather patterns and, and more extreme weather conditions and the numbers of disasters happening. And so um, having a strong risk management base is very important. Um, crop insurance has always had the, a, a range of options for major commodities like corn and soy and cotton, largely driven by the access to data and the ability to really quantify that risk. Um, but it has not done well for products that are um, produced for specialty markets um, and for um, products like livestock or um, 
or uh, uh, specialty crops. So there are a series of products that are not well served and, and, and don't have, have not had the benefit of those crop insurance policies. Um, there also may be uninsured um, income into the farm from other enterprises. Um, you know, folks often have something that they do on the side that's a, you know, they may grow watermelons or pumpkins or, you know, something like that that, that is a significant income stream and this allows them to cover that. Um, so what does whole farm revenue do? One of the big things is that a whole farm revenue incentivizes diversification. In essence, the more diversified the farm is, the better the deal that they get. And the, the, the better, the more of the, um, the subsidy and the higher the coverage. Um, it, rec it can recognize a proven farmer price. So if a farmer has a history of a price that they're able to get for their product over time, in livestock that might be grass-fed beef or direct market beef or um, chickens or um, something that they're selling into a different market, um, you know, free range or, um, you know, a, a pastured pork or something like that. If you can show a price over time, you can get the insurance at that price. Um, it allows the insurance of previously uninsured products, like, uh, like we're talking about here, and livestock can be insured up to a million dollars in income. So first of all, some basics on crop insurance for people who haven't, who don't have experience for it. And I apologize, you know, many folks probably are very familiar with it, but I'm just going to run through this really quick so that you just have, a, you know, the background on it. Um, crop insurance is a public-private partnership between the USDA and private insurance companies. For USDA's part, USDA defines the policies. It provides a subsidy of the premiums. Um, for whole farm revenue, that subsidy can be as much as 80%. It pays companies directly for administration instead of it having to come out of the premium, which also lowers the cost to farmers. And it has some level of sharing in really catastrophic losses. Um, on the other hand, what the private insurance companies do is that they actually sell the insurance to the farmer. So while it's a USDA program, where you purchase it is from a private insurance company. Um, the insurance companies have to provide all of the policies that are available in that area. And some policies are available in some states and not others. That's not true. You know, whole farm revenue is, is available everywhere. Um, and they have to follow the guidelines and the policies. So the, the criteria that USDA sets out, the you know, the company can't say, well, we're going to change this a little bit or we're going to make it differently or we're going to change the restrictions. They have to take it as, the, as USDA dictates. Um, in any insurance policy, there are basically five definitions in that policy. What's being insured? What's, how was the value determined before the loss? What is an eligible loss? What is the situation in which a loss can happen? What's the value after the loss? How did, does that get determined? And then what's the percentage of the difference that will be paid, which is the indemnity? And this is true of any of any um, insurance that you guys use, your car insurance, your health insurance, whatever. It's, it's basically those things are defined in the policy. So for general multi-parallel crop insurance, um, what it insures is a crop within a farm. Um, so an individual crop, the value can be determined by actual production history or revenue history or an independent um, number like county average. Um, for livestock policies, that is generally based on, um, the, the prices are based, generally based on national prices rather than a historical price. Um, Losses are generally what's outside of a person's control. You know, so if a if a land is if land is flooded by a hurricane, then that's a loss. But if you screw up and break a hole in the dam, and and then and and um, you know your pond, and then that floods your land, you know that's on you. So it's so some of those things are are you know it's generally what's outside of your control. Um, generally, losses are determined by an adjuster who comes and expects the field. There's an expectation certainly of um, documentation of losses and. Um, you know, the documentation of, of uh, you know, what the value was and what was present. Um, and different policies can have different coverage levels from catastrophic, which is a 55% level up to about 80%. So the existing livestock policies, there are a couple of them. I'm not going to go deeply into them here, just to mention that they exist. The livestock risk margin policy, which is cattle, dairy, or swine, so not poultry, but those, those three. Um, and this is an actual price minus fee, an estimate of feed cost, depending on the on which of these it is. Um, the livestock risk protection um, sets a, a guaranteed price, and then it's the actual price minus the guaranteed price. Um, but those actual prices are based on the futures prices and or the Chicago Merck, um, and they're only available in limited states. So um, you know, if, if anyone's selling livestock at anything higher than just what the prices are on the Chicago Mercantile. Um, then it's not covered, that added value is not covered here. 
So for whole farm revenue, um, what whole farm revenue does is it ensures the annual gross revenue from the whole, the entire farm operation as a complete unit. Um, that initial insurance level is determined by a five-year average of the Schedule F as filed in the person or the farm's taxes. Um, if a person is a beginning farmer and has farmed less, fewer than five years, then that requirement can be taken down to three years. Um, the loss is determined then by the Schedule F from the insured year. So um, part of the part of what you need to understand about that is that so if I have a loss in 2016, I'm not going to be paid until I file my Schedule F and my taxes in the beginning of 2017, um, depending on when your fiscal year is. Um, the rate of coverage is up to 85% of the, that five-year average income. So when is it better to have whole farm or multi -parole? Um Whole farm is really good for diverse operations, especially if there's significant income from products that are valued at something other than the conventional wholesale price. Um, it also covers crops that don't have specific crop insurance policies. Um, now, when it's available, because of the way risk analysis works, the multi parallel crop insurance is, is generally more cost effective, but those other policies can be nested inside whole farm revenue with whole farm revenue ensuring the difference between what can be covered in a multi parallel crop insurance policy or one of those livestock policies versus the whole revenue of the farm. Um, so if a farmer produces a range of products, has significant income from an alternative market or an enterprise, they can get the multi parallel for their corn or soy or something like that and then cover the rest of their income from whole farm revenue. Um, just to run through how it works really quickly, so let's say Anna has a history of producing $100,000 each from corn and soy, $50,000 from some direct market grass-fed beef, and $50,000 from a specialty wheat for a local miller. That sets her average revenue at $300,000. With the diversification, the coverage is at the 85% level, so 85% of $300,000 is $255,000. So $255,000 is her coverage level. So let's say the, um, you know, and, and so any, any losses on the soybeans or corn are covered by a multi parallel crop insurance policy, so payments from those policies would count as income in the whole farm gross. But let's say that she loses half the income on the beef and half on the wheat, what that means is that with the 100000 from each of the corn and soy, the, then the, the 25000 from each, so that her income would be 25000 That's $5,000 less, so her, um, her payment would be $5,000. That's the $255,000 coverage minus the $250,000 in income. On the other hand, if you have the same scenario, if she makes an extra $20,000 each on the corn and soy, so instead of $100,000, she would have $120,000 each in the corn and soy, then that um, then the total income would be two hundred ninety thousand, so there would not be a payment there. So because that's above the two hundred fifty five thousand, so the an increase in income from one crop can offset a loss in a different crop. So that's sort of a, a, a gross picture of how this works. A couple of main points as as I'm finishing up. First of all, this application process can be somewhat complicated. It's best not to wait until the last minute. It's best to get in there and start talking to folks about it and, and start getting it lined up. Um, do your best to find an agent who is knowledgeable about the policy. Um, there may be situations where you need to you know, learn about it together, and there are a lot of tools for doing that. Certainly shouldn't hold you back from doing it, but um, you know, it's helpful to have somebody who's, who's, who's been through it a time or two. Um, the, the policy can cover minimal processing that's needed to bring the crop to market. Um, you know, like putting produce in a box to go to market or something like that. But it does not cover processing that adds value. Um, so, and, and the other part of it is that the growth factor is important. So if the, if the farm is growing, um, you know, if, the, if, if you've grown over time, there is a growth factor that allows you to increase that coverage level, and Cliff will go over that in just a minute. But it's good to understand where those edges are because if you go beyond that, um, the revenue still counts against the total income and it can effectively reduce the coverage level. So it's good just to, to think through the situations, like with any insurance, it's good to think through the situations in terms of you know, what would be paid out at what levels and those kinds of things, and, and just to make sure you know really exactly what you're getting. But any agent should be able to walk you through that and to be able to, um, to, be able to talk through it. Um, so thanks very much for, um, for listening and for this, this first part. I'm going to um, then turn it over to Cliff, who's going to take you through some of the more specific details on the policy. 
Great. Thank you so much, Scott. That was really wonderful. And we're going to switch over to Cliff now, who's joined us. Okay. Let me get my slideshow up and I'll show my screen. Perfect. Okay, am I on? I think so. Okay. Good cool. afternoon, everyone. Or, okay. Yeah, I guess it depends on where we're at. Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, uh, what I'm going to be talking about specifics, um, Scott gave you a very good overview of the whole farm and how it works in conjunction with crop insurance. Um, one thing that we always get a lot of questions about is, uh, will this work for row crops? Will this work for this? Will it work for livestock? Yes, whole farm is just what it says, the whole farm policy, and it works for everybody. Uh, give you a little of my background. I grew up on a diversified farm in North Carolina. We grew everything, chickens, hogs, cattle. This was back before the contract, and so we grew it all for ourselves and sold it on the open market. Um, and we grew soybeans, corn, cotton, so we were very diversified. We also had vegetable crops uh, that we sold at uh, fruit stands at the beach because we live right close to the beach in uh, coastal North Carolina. I'm a graduate of North Carolina School of Agriculture, and I retired as assistant deputy administrator of crop insurance, where I had major input in developing the predecessor to uh, whole farm, which was adjusted gross revenue, and then just to be able to include livestock, we come up with a product called adjusted gross revenue light. Okay, what does whole farm cover? It covers everything. Revenue from all commodities produced on the farm, including animal, and I keep stressing this, including animal and animal products. Um, you can't have a 50% resale, so if you raise 200 head of cattle, and you have a fruit stand on the side and you raise tomatoes and corn, soybeans and all that, but you had to buy some of your tomatoes and bring them in, that's okay to sell as long as they have 50%. Uh, this product excludes timber, forestry products and things like that. Another good thing about this um, product is it has replants. On every crop that's covered, it has a replant clause. So if you have livestock and then you've got corn, soybeans, there's replant costs on the soybeans and the corn or whatever commodity you'd be covering. All right, the coverage levels on this product anywhere from 50 to 85 percent, uh, which is uh, really good coverage. In most cases, I'd say the highest, the highest percentage, if you look on a chart, most people buy at the 75 percent level. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I'll show you in just a minute. Um, um, you can only buy the 80 and 85 percent level if you have three commodities. Uh, so if you have cattle, corn, soybeans, uh, you can buy the 80 and 85 percent level. If you just have cattle, you would only you'd be limited to the 75 percent uh, level of coverage. Or you just had corn, or just one commodity. Uh, so that's important to know. You've got to have at least three commodities. And you cannot buy a catastrophic level of whole farm. Um, so you could buy catastrophic levels of, you know, your levels of corn, soybeans, but on cropping on whole farm, you have to buy what we call additional, which is at least 50 uh, percent. You have to buy at least 50 percent, and and it's not a catastrophic level. You do have a premium associated with it. Uh, historic revenues adjust to reflect farm expansion. So there is a process where if you grow your crops, whether it's more livestock, more acres of row crops or whatever, you can grow up to 35% uh, above your five-year average. Um, cost for market readiness operations may be left in approved revenue. Now, you cannot have cattle and then make hamburger or make steaks and sell those. That costs what we call added value. That is not insurable. The livestock themselves are insurable, and let's say you've got tomatoes. Tomatoes are insurable, but you cannot make tomato paste. That cost of that additional would have to come out of your revenue. Um, what we say is it's minimum required to make commodity ready. So if you put tomatoes in a box, you've got to have a box. You can't sell them in the market in your hands. But no added value cost. Um, other federal crop insurance policies covering individual commodities may be purchased. Uh, so let's say you've got um, you've got cattle. So you most likely got hay land and, and pasture, so you can buy a PRF policy, pasture, rangeland, and forage policy on your on your um, on your hay land. You can buy if you got corn and soybeans, you can buy additional coverage for that. You cannot buy the cat. You've got to buy at least a 5100 or up coverage levels. 
or and you can also buy the livestock risk protection program on your cattle, feed cattle, or feeder cattle. So, um, and one thing to keep in mind, if you buy policies, uh, they count as part of your revenue. So if you have a loss and you bring in money under the PRF, that is considered revenue at the end of the year when we start figuring your, uh, your revenue to count for loss purposes. All farm revenue is insured together under one policy. That makes things a lot simpler. If you have 15 commodities and cattle, so you got 16 different crops, we consider it, because cattle is considered in as one of those crops. So you got 16 different crops out there. That's a lot of paperwork with 16 policies. This, this will combine all of them into one, and it's revenue. It's actual revenue. So that's one of the great things about this. Uh, premium subsidy. Crop insurance, as you know, if you have any involvement with crop insurance, is heavily subsidized by USDA. The reason for that is uh, Scott made a little, had some conversation alluding to this, talking about disaster payments. In years gone past, um, I've been to agriculture all my life. I'm right at 61 years old, and I've been uh, back and forth since college. I work with USDA either as an employee of USDA or now as a consultant and uh, working with the crop insurance program and developing new programs and all. We used to have a disaster program. So you have a disaster such as Hurricane Matthew or something like that, a big flood, hurricane, a severe drought. You'd had to petition Congress. They'd decide, well, I'm going to give this county a disaster, that one one. They decided back in 1994 they were going to do away with that, and they were going to start having insurance for everyone. That's when we started saying we're going to raise these levels of subsidies so everyone can, can afford the insurance. Um, and if you look at this chart, you'll see the product is very affordable. Um, if you take a 75% level, which I told you, you would see on the chart it spikes at 75 for old farm. Uh, the subsidy is 85% if you have more than one commodity. Now, if you're only growing cattle, and that's all, you'd have one commodity, your subsidy would be 55%. You couldn't buy the 80 85% level. So if you've got two commodities, you can buy 75 is the max you can buy with just two commodities. So if you have corn and cattle, you get 80% subsidy at 75% level, but you can't buy higher levels. If you want to buy 80 and 85, you've got to have three crops. As you can see, though, once you get past 75, the subsidy drops, and the premium rate will increase because there's more chance of loss. As you know, it's a greater chance of paying indemnity. So the rate goes up, subsidy goes down. As you can see, the spike's right there at 75. That's where most people buy. Uh, who's covered? Everybody's covered, nationwide. Every county all over the United States. That's the first crop insurance product that's available nationwide. OK, now, there is some limits on the qualification for this. Uh, if you're over $8.5 million of revenue, uh, covers $8.5 million of revenue. And what that means is that the lowest level of coverage is 50%. So if you're over $17 million is your average revenue, then you can't qualify for this program. So that goes pretty big, though, $17 million. And for today's program, we're, we're sort of keying in on, uh, on livestock. If you've got over a million dollars in expected revenue from animals or animal products, you can't uh, purchase this product. You're not qualified. Or nursery, million dollars. So you can be pretty big in the, in the cattle industry, but if you go over a million dollars in expected revenue, then you'd be excluded. That does not cover breeder stock. That is what you expect in revenue from that, from that crop. So if you've got uh, a calf-cow operation, uh, a cow-calf operation, excuse me, then that million dollars is what you expect in revenue is going to be, not those, not those you're holding, those uh, breeder cows. So some people get mixed up on that. We're talking about what the expected revenue has got to be over a million dollars for cattle before you're excluded. Okay, uh, what farms can benefit from whole farm? I think everyone can, but high diverse farms definitely gets more benefit because two or more um, two or more uh, commodities and you get 80 percent subsidy. That's when it really gets affordable. This product does. Uh, I'm not saying it's not affordable even for one commodity. You need to look at it, and if you have just one commodity, because it's good coverage, and but the risk is greater for USDA and the company when you when you have one commodity then. And so that's the reason we go with 
uh, higher higher um, subsidy and lower rates, the more diversity you have. Farms are specialty commodities, and the reason that's well suited because they it's not insurance readily available for a lot of these products. Uh, farms selling direct markets, specialty markets, regional local markets, um, and so farms that has farm identity preserve markets. People that sell above the normal market value. Um, this really works good because it helps incorporate that price into the guarantee. It's available to all farms or ranches that qualify, which you've seen who qualifies, almost everybody except for those few uh, that are eliminated because over a million revenue from animal products, over a million from nursery. Floriculture is not considered in that million. It's got to be nursery, so floriculture cut flowers is separated from that, or you're over $17 million. Now, how, does, how do you base your guarantee? The, the whole farm revenue is a lower of the current year's expected revenue on your farm plan at the selected coverage level. So what you do is if you expect to bring in based on current year's cattle prices, current year's corn prices, you expect to bring in a million dollars, and then you take the five-year historic revenue is a million dollars. That's your five-year adjusted for growth then it would take the lower of those two. So if both of them are a million, it'd be based on the million, and then you could buy anywhere from 50 to 75, to, excuse me, anywhere from 50 to 85 percent, about 80 and 85 if you had three commodities or more. You could buy anywhere from 50 to 75 if you only had two commodities, one or two commodities. Okay, does diversification on the farm matter? Yes, it definitely matters. Uh, the number of commodities produced are counted toward the diversification requirement within whole farm. Each commodity must provide a calculated percentage of the expected farm revenue to be counted. What that means is, all right, the way this product works is from we have a lower premium rate or you have a diversification subsidy, basically. You have a lower rate for every crop that goes in your diversification mix up to seven crops. So if you have five crops and your neighbor has seven crops, his premium rate's going to be lower than yours because he's got more crops in diversification, uh, which, as you know, the more diverse you are, the less chance they are to having a loss because you're spreading your risk over more crops. Okay. And now, but you can't just plant one hill of tomatoes and say, I've got tomatoes as a crop. What you've got to do is you've got to have um, a certain number of the, um, you've got to have a certain amount of that product to qualify. And I would explain that, but it, it gets a little complex. But the bottom line it's got to be it's got to be a contributor to your products, you know. So okay. The diversification measure determines your eligibility for whole farm. Uh, potato farms must have two commodities. Now what that means is what that means is is if only if you farm and potatoes are your only crop, you cannot buy whole farm. That is something that come about because of um, some legislative legislative um, requirements that the National Potato Growers uh, Board came up with years ago. They did not want strict revenue on potatoes because they were afraid it would flood the market. But now if you have potatoes and corn, you can do it, or potatoes and cattle, or potatoes and sheep, whatever. But if you just had it one commodity, and commodities insurable with other revenue coverage, you must have two commodities. What that means is if you've got corn, is the only crop you got, and there is revenue coverage already available on corn, you cannot buy a whole farm if corn's your only product. Now, if you grow corn and soybeans, you can buy you can buy um, the whole farm policy. The diversification measure all determines the amount of diversification discount. I've already talked about that all the way up to seven. And you must have at least two commodities to get that 80% subsidy. Whole farm covers revenue produced in the insurance year. Okay, this is this is important because let's say you have potatoes, sweet potatoes, or corn, soybeans, and you carry over. You put them in a bin. You don't sell them this year, but they're still produced this year. What we would do is go out and measure what's in the bin. That would count on this year's product. Okay, that would count on this year's product. It would uh, it would count this year's revenue. Okay, yeah. It would count on this year's revenue. So um, anything that you've sold and you have not got the money for it would count on this year because that would be considered accounts receivable. Okay. Now for uh, cattle, 
for commodities that grow each year, like cattle. Only the growth for the insurance year counts. Example, calves worth eight hundred dollars at the beginning of the year will be sold at two thousand. The value insured will be twelve hundred dollars because that's what the value has increased that year. So for cattle, we'd come up with the value at the beginning of the year. We'd agree on a value, and then we'd agree on what the value is going to be at the end of the year, and that's what the, that's what your guarantee be based on. You know what it's been, what the value increase is for that year, and um, and as I explained, the inventory and accounts receivable. You have to count those. Uh, prices used to value the commodities to be grown must meet the expected value guidelines in the policy. Um, so what we try to do is we try to arrive at exactly what price you plan to sell that commodity for. Cattle, for example. What we would do with cattle is on if the sales closing for your area is February 28th or March 15th, on or very close to that date, we would look at Chicago Board of Trade price for when you plan to sell those cattle. So if you've got cattle in February and you say, I plan to sell them next November, we would look at the futures for November and we'd say in November cattle prices uh, are projected to be a dollar and ten cent. That's what it is. That's what we would use to establish your price for cattle for that year. We would use whatever the future says it should be at that point. Uh, now what's cause of loss under WRP, uh, WFRP? Natural cause of loss and uh, that means if you have uh, four cattle die because lightning strikes, that would be a loss that's covered or the price drops. Okay. And then uh, natural cause of loss and decline in market price during the insurance period. So if the price um, of cattle drops, okay, we've insured you at dollar ten. We say that's what we think it's going to be. Say the price goes to fifty cent. That's covered. Uh, three cattle get hit by lightning. That's covered. A uh, flood comes along. Twenty-two of your cattle get flooded and gets killed. Um, anything like that. A disease comes along and kills the cattle. There's nothing you can do. Some kind of infectious disease comes in. That, that's that's covered. So natural cause of loss and, and the decline in market price are both covered. Um, uh, one of the drawbacks, if there is one, if you could say what is the negatives of this policy, is that you must file the taxes before we can do a claim because this is based on your Schedule F and what you file on your taxes that's how you guarantee set up five years, and then your claims paid on that five years so off, off of that year that you have the insurance. So for 17, you buy the insurance, we guarantee you a million dollars, and when you, you have 24 cattle die, the price drops, you had some corn, and the corn price went from 380 a bushel to three dollars, uh, and then you had some soybeans, you had a drought on those, and you only brought in 800,000, we guaranteed you a million, you get paid $200,000. That's the way it works. It's, it's a straight revenue product. Uh, when revenue count for the insurance year is lower than the insurance revenue, you get a payment. That's how simple that is. Um, as I said, now to qualify, you need five years of tax records. We prefer to Schedule F, but if you do a Schedule C, your agent can go in and do what they call a supplemental Schedule F. Um, if you're a new, new producer and you only have uh, 15, 14, and 13. You can still buy this product. That's a very that's a new option. Just started for last year. New way to offer it. Used to you had to have five years. Now, if you've got five years, you've got to, you've got to give those up. You can't just use the three. Those three are just for beginning farmers that only have 15, 14, and 13. So the minimum requirements you've got to have 15, 14, and 13 uh, tax forms. Then what we do is we ask you what's going to be farmed on the farm that year. How many cattle you got, how many you plan to sell, the market value of those cattle we determine and all that up front. And those are, that's what you require. There's not, the farmer, this is not overly burdensome. It's, it, uh, the agent has work to do because they have determined the price on the cattle, the price on the corn, soybeans, tomatoes. Uh, all you have to do as a farmer is tell us, get your Schedule Fs. A lot of times your accountant can send those to us email. Or, or, or you can just make copies and give them to your agent, uh, and then you got to give us your intended acres up front. So by sales closing, you had to give us your intended acreage report, and then later on in the year, by like July, you have to tell us exactly what you got. Uh, your cattle, you know about that. 
Now, if you buy more cattle, we need to know that. But we pretty much know from from the get-go how much cattle you got acreage. You could plan to plant 200 acres, but then later in the year you decided to only plant 100. We revise it, and then after the end of the year, we go back in and do a final report. You know, uh, when when can you buy this product? You got plenty of time. Right now, you're in good shape. It's it's uh, even before Christmas. Uh, so the earliest sales closing date is January 31st. Most areas of the country, sales closing is February 28th to March 15th. Um, so you have to have those Schedule Fs in place, an intended operation report. All that has to be done prior to uh, that sales closing date. Uh, one other thing I'd be remiss if we didn't mention is you have to have for any crop insurance uh, to receive that subsidy, that 80% or that 55% subsidy, whatever subsidy you're getting, you have to have an AD 1026 on file, which is your which is your conservation through your FSA office. You have to have a conservation plan in, in place. Now, one of the other beauties of this policy is you don't have to pay for it up front. You're billed on August the 15th, and um, and uh, that's for for calendar year filers, which most people are, or early physical filers, January to July filers, late filers. You're billed in December the first. Um, and then you have 30 days to pay it without any interest, but you want to make sure that if you buy the product for next year, buy February 28th or January 31st or March 15th, whatever the sales closing date is, make sure you pay that premium because if not, you're excluded from all USDA programs for the entire year. So if you owe money on that last date and you don't make an arrangement to pay it or pay it. Um, okay, and then Make sure if you buy the product by the end of the year, that last uh, buy, the sales closing date of the next year, you give your last year's um, your last year's uh, final report. If not, you're limited to 65% level. Now, all of this is really good stuff, but if you don't know where to buy it, it's absolutely useless. So what you need to do is two things. You can go on RMA's website. I'm going to leave that up a minute so everyone can write it down. Uh, or take a picture with your phone. To snap this, uh, screen, take this picture on your computer, and you go on this website. You get every agent in the United States that writes in your area, uh, or you can go to your local FSA office and uh, and and uh, and you can ask them who the closest agent is. Okay, well that concludes my part, and uh, Anna, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Hey, thank you so much, Cliff. That's really it's just. So great to hear your expertise and all this information on um, how to apply whole farm for livestock operations. Um, yeah, so now we're going to open it up for questions. Um, any of our listeners, if you can put your questions into the question box, um, and we'll and we'll um, address them. Um, but I guess I'll we'll start off. Um, um, and I want to make sure that um, Scott will back on you. Um, yes, one of the things I'd like to talk about is um, um, one of the things that's interesting about this program is that that it's um, since it's a revenue program, um, your the points that both of you made about how um, you know if you're raising livestock and you're not expecting any revenue from them in the in that year, you're unable to insure them. Is that can you just kind of Go back over that to make sure that we're all we're all clear on that. Oh, your revenue is based on what the increase is that year of the revenue. So yes, it's whatever you expect to sell that year with what you would insure. That's exactly correct. Because this is a revenue product, so it's whatever you plan to sell that year is what we need to base your um, your coverage on. What you plan to sell that year. And if you plan to sell it and you don't sell it, then all we do is take that cattle and we would take whatever price they were. All right, let's say you plan to sell 200 head this year. So that's in your expected revenue. Okay, we got that set up. On, on uh, December 31st, you didn't sell them because the price dropped and you said, I don't lose all that money. So what you do is you can, what we would do is the loss adjuster would have to go out or if the price, the Chicago Board of Trade price is 80 cents, then we would take the weight of your cattle, and we'd probably do an estimate. I don't think he would make you go out and weigh them. He would probably do an estimate of weights of the cattle, multiply that times 80 cents, 
and that's what would count as your revenue for that year. So yes, you could lose revenue during that year, even though you didn't sell the cattle, but because what it is is the value, and then that would be the starting value for the next year. You follow me? I think so. Okay. Um, well, you you get. That... Here's what I would say. We could we could talk and talk about this, but it gets complex a little bit in that nature. I would really suggest that a producer with cattle sit down with an agent because you know I do want to give you no incorrect answer. There's going to be different answers for different issues with this livestock. What uh, if you've got any interest in this product? Now's the time to do it right now because you got plenty of time. We've got at least till January 31st at the very least. Get with an agent. If that agent cannot address your questions, I will be glad to work with you individually to try to answer your questions on an individual basis. I hate to get too much blanket into this livestock because it's going to be according to that individual producer. So like I said, if, if an individual producer has a specific question about that, what I tell them to do is contact the agent right now, immediately. That gives them plenty of time. If the agent cannot answer their question, they can contact you. you. I'm very welcome for them to you to give them my contact information and I will get them an answer. Either I can answer it individually or I can go through the whole farm revenue has a team with RMA and I send them questions directly. Me and Scott do all the time. And a lot of things come up that I'm not saying anybody knows all the answers. This is a new product. It's been around three years. So it, let's say if a question comes up that I can't answer, what I will do is I'll email it up to the Kansas City office with the whole farm teams at. They'll address me and the farmer. But like I said, right now we've got plenty of time. Now's the time for them to get those questions in. Great. Thank you, Cliff. Scott, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think that that's, I think he hit it. Uh, um, you know, the big thing is to go ahead and get in and, um, you know, start working through the scenarios. It's always good um, when you're looking at something like this, it's always good to sort of think through what are likely losses, you know, what, what things have you seen happen, what could happen, um, and just lay out what the policy covers and, you know, how, you know, what kind of payments would happen and things like that, just so that you know exactly what you're getting going in. Um, you want to make sure that you really understand what the coverage covers and doesn't, as is true with any crop insurance or any kind of insurance. You want to understand how that pays, you know, that pays out so that you can do a good evaluation of cost versus benefits. Um, and just thinking through, um, just thinking through what that does. Now, one thing that I want to make sure of, it, it's, it's my understanding, and Cliff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if folks have production contracts that would be like for poultry or hogs, because they do not own the product, because a person does not own, under a production contract, the person does not own the chicken or the hogs, that is not eligible for insurance. Um, you have to own the product. Um, and so, you know, that's, so that, that would not include most of the very large scale poultry and, you know, some, not all, but some of the hog operations that are under those kinds of production contracts. But that sort of adds a wrinkle to it that's a little bit different from um, just regular, um, regular livestock. Is that right? I, I just want to make sure, Cliff, that I got that right. Yes, you're exactly right. Any of your contract, poultry, hogs, you don't have that much in cattle. You know, it's pretty much poultry right. and hogs. We're even seeing it now some in sweet potatoes. Um, so it's the same with that. If you if you just if you're just growing under contract and the product does not belong to you, you're just growing it. They furnish the the chicken, the hog, and then you just the product they buy it back at the end. Yes, that is not covered under whole farm. We've got that, but that don't mean that don't mean if you're a hog farm producer or you're a turkey producer or you're a chicken producer, you can't buy a whole farm. What we would do is just exclude that income. A lot of farmers now are keeping that under a separate entity. That's that's a probably a very good idea to keep your contract under another. Idea. But I'm not suggesting what you do for entities. You need to talk with your attorney, your accountant about that. But I say a lot of farmers do. But now. Even if it's the same entity, you can exclude that. So that does not totally eliminate you from the program. It just means that part of your revenue is not insurable. You're exactly right, Scott. Great. And I just want to uh, recognize Tom asked a question that I think you both covered about uh, whether hogs are covered at the contracted price. Um, so Tom, if we didn't answer your question completely, um, you know, 
let us know. Um, I guess I think we did. You both did a great. Oh, hold up. Um, oh, we've got we've got another question. Hold on, pulling it up. We got a question from somebody saying, um, I am just a cattle feeder with 100 head and have about 50 bred cows, and I would only be covered for 50%. Is that right? Uh, no. He can be covered for up to 75% with just cattle. You can't go above 75% unless you have more than one. So if his only commodity is cattle, he could buy 75% level. He couldn't buy 80 and 85. Great, thank you. Hey, now let me make sure. Let me make sure. Now is he over a million dollars? If he's over a million dollars of revenue, expected revenue from cattle, he could not qualify. But long as long as his expected revenue from his cattle is less than a million dollars, he could buy seventy five percent level. Gotcha. Um yeah. Yeah, Rick, please follow up with us if um we didn't answer. Anything else? If we didn't answer your question completely. Um, so, yeah, you guys did a great job in covering all my all my prepped questions. You covered pretty much, you know, what the what the documents are that people need to gather um, in order to get their get started on getting their whole farm policy set up. Um, and thank you for, for sharing the links on how to find a crop insurance agent. Um, and I think it's, I think, so if your point about how it's important to reach out to your crop insurance agent now to start working out the details of getting, of getting yeah. the program in place is a really important one. Yeah, farmers have a tendency to wait until about the middle of February if sales closing is uh, February 28th, they wait till about March if it's March 15th, and that's not a real good thing to do with a policy such as this. Uh, with a lot of the MPCI policies, all you have to do is sign up an uh, application by the sales closing. But with this one, we've got to have your Schedule S, we've got to have your intended report. It's, it, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work for your agent. It's not a whole lot of work for the farmer, but he's got to have these things in place and have them signed. So now's the time. Don't wait. Most people don't even think about crop insurance that first year. I would say go ahead and call your agent, tell him I'm interested, tell him what your crops are, go ahead and get a quote, go ahead and get a quote, and so you'll know is it, is it something that's in my price range, you know, you want to do that right now. Great. Um, I guess... Okay, well, I'm going to slip off, get ready for the next webinar then. Um, thanks a lot. I've enjoyed it, and I hope we answered everyone's questions. Yeah, let's have any more questions. Cool. Okay, uh, we'll end a couple minutes early. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you all.